Hi, and welcome to episode 51 of Toke Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest in cannabis and hemp news stories every week. I'm Steve Elliott. I'll be guiding you through the news after we look at our bud pick of the week. This week we have a pretty AK-47 times Northern Lights flower for you. I found this for just $10 a gram at Kitsap Cannabis Farmers Fair. And if you're thinking like I am, hmm, AK-47 times Northern Lights, that sounds like the 90s greatest hits. Hits, get it? Okay, okay. Let's do the news. In the United States this week, Senator Rand Paul filed a measure to protect medical marijuana states from the federal government. Senator Paul filed this on Thursday. It's an amendment to Senate Bill 2569, the Bring Jobs Home Act, that would explicitly allow states to pass medical marijuana laws despite the Federal Controlled Substances Act. The amendment would also bar prosecutions of patients and doctors involved in medical marijuana when they are in compliance with state laws. Amendment 3630 allows states to enact and implement laws that authorize the use, distribution, possession, or cultivation of marijuana for medical use without federal prosecution. The amendment then lists 33 states and the District of Columbia that have medical marijuana laws at variance with the Federal Controlled Substances Act, including 10 states that allow only for the use of CBD oil, cannabidiol, which unlike THC isn't psychoactive. What we're trying to do is look at the law and allow states that have changed their laws and have allowed medical marijuana to do so, for doctors to be able to prescribe and for people to be able to get those prescriptions without being worried that the federal government is going to come in and arrest them, said Brian Darling, who happens to be Senator Rand Paul's communication director. The federal government continues to classify marijuana as a Schedule I substance with no currently accepted medical use and a high risk of abuse. Senator Paul, widely believed to have presidential aspirations, in June introduced another Senate amendment to the Justice Department budget bill, which would restrict DEA agents and U.S. attorneys from using their allotted funds to go after medical marijuana providers and patients in states where medical cannabis is legal. A similar version of that amendment was co-sponsored by Representatives Dana Rohrabacher, Republican from California, and his fellow Californian Sam Farr, Democrat. After a decade of attempts, it finally passed the House in May. Senator Paul's press agent argued that the new measure could provide additional protections beyond what the Rohrabacher Farr Amendment allows. The effort before was to defund prosecutions so it would block the federal government from prosecuting until that appropriations bill runs out about a year later, Darling said. But Senator Paul's new amendment, Darling explained, would provide a more permanent and formal framework of protection for states that enact their own medical marijuana laws. It would protect states' rights to make those decisions about medical marijuana that wouldn't expire when the appropriations bill comes back up, Darling explained. Senator Paul's amendment appears unlikely to ever get a vote due to partisan gridlock in the Senate. But Darling said the junior senator from Kentucky is willing to introduce other legislation that may not be identical to the amendment but would have the same practical effects. In Oregon this week, a marijuana legalization and regulation measure officially qualified for the November ballot. Yes, it's official. Oregon voters will decide in November whether to regulate, tax, and legalize marijuana for adults 21 and older. Oregon Secretary of State Kate Brown has certified that the New Approach Oregon Petition Campaign has turned in enough valid signatures to qualify the Control, Regulation, and Taxation of Marijuana and Industrial Hemp Act for the November ballot. According to the Secretary of State's website, 145,030 unverified signatures were submitted for verification. Of those, 88,584, or just over 64%, were valid. To qualify for the ballot, 87,213 were needed, so it qualified by just 1,000 signatures. The New Approach campaign is celebrating Tuesday's achievement by hosting its first voter registration canvas led by young Oregonians who will be decisive in winning a new approach to marijuana, they say. This is our movement to be part of history and to lead a movement, said Dominic Lopez, Metro Regional Organizer for New Approach Oregon. Treating marijuana use as a crime has failed, she said, but together we can win a more sensible approach and better the lives of Oregonians. Tuesday's announcement came almost exactly two weeks after Washington State began regulated sales of marijuana, and we'll be coming back to that in a moment. 
New data shows that Washington State has received $318,000 in excise taxes in the first 10 days of regulated marijuana sales. The proposed measure in Oregon would allow for licensed and regulated cultivation and sales of marijuana. Sales would be taxed to generate money for schools, state and local police, and drug treatment prevention and mental health programs. In Illinois this week, a Chicago hospital said it wants to sell medical marijuana, but it's stymied by federal law. If officials at Chicago's Swedish Covenant Hospital get their wish, authorized medical marijuana patients could one day buy their cannabis at a hospital dispensary, just like patients buying antibiotics or pain relievers at the hospital's pharmacy. We have professionals who very much would like to prescribe these drugs. We have the system in place to manage it, and we have the patient population that needs it, said Marcia Jimenez, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs at Swedish Covenant Hospital. It just made a lot of sense, she said. The hospital would like to be the first in Illinois to take advantage of the legalization of marijuana for medicinal purposes in the state. Illinois has agreed to issue 60 permits to sell medical marijuana, 13 of which will be in Chicago. Swedish Covenant would really like one of those 13, but it's hamstrung by federal law under which marijuana is illegal for any purpose. If the hospital were to become a dispensary at this point, we would be violating the federal law and jeopardizing reimbursements for Medicare and Medicaid, Jimenez said. Hospital administrators are also worried that they could be targeted for criminal activity and get in tax trouble with the Internal Revenue Service. It's not something the hospital could risk and still stay financially viable, Jimenez said. So we're outspoken about it. We think hospitals are the best choice for dispensing marijuana. Unless someone speaks up, we're not going to be able to change the federal law. No hospital in any of the 23 medical marijuana states, nor in Washington, D.C., has ever sold any marijuana, according to Chris Lindsay, legislative analyst for the Marijuana Policy Project. Swedish Covenant oncologist Jeffrey Silly said doctors that are interested in using medical marijuana with their cancer patients to deal with pain, nausea, and anxiety should be able to have that option. There's an incredible interest from a lot of patients, Silly said. I've had patients that have traveled out of state to try to experiment and see. If Swedish Covenant ever opens a medical marijuana dispensary, it would be inside an existing pharmacy on California Avenue, according to Ramesh Patel, Director of Pharmacy Services at that hospital. What could be more secure than what we are doing right now, Patel said. We are already dispensing opioids and all kinds of narcotics. Swedish Covenant boss Mark Newton acknowledged marijuana is also a money-making opportunity. We have to find ways of getting out and in front of issues and really looking at opportunities where we can stay on track and on par with what the consumer is looking for, Newton said. Illinois requires that marijuana dispensaries be at least a thousand feet from schools, playgrounds, child care centers, public parks, or libraries. Now, Swedish Covenant abuts a school but Newton has asked the state to exempt hospitals from that particular requirement. We'll see. In the state of Washington right now, as most of you are aware, limited legalization measure I-502 is being implemented, and so much is happening on that front that for the first time ever, our next four stories in a row are all about the same state. We've had three in a row before. The next four will look at legalization implementation in Washington state from four different angles and it's pretty illuminating when you look at it this way. First of all, in Washington, the first recreational marijuana sold legally in Seattle is now headed for a museum exhibit. The very first pot legally sold in Seattle will become part of a display at the city's Museum of History and Industry after the woman who was first in line donated part of her purchase on Tuesday. 65-year-old retiree Deb Green had waited all night to be the first customer in line at Cannabis City so far, Seattle's long recreational marijuana store, when legal cannabis sales began in Washington on July 8th. Cannabis City proprietor James Lathrop also donated items from opening day, including the receipt for Green's purchase. Voters in both Colorado and Washington, of course, voted in November 2012 to legalize recreational marijuana for adults 21 and older. But Colorado was first out of the gate with legal marijuana sales beginning January 1st of this year. Washington State's burdensome, bureaucracy-laden system took until July 8th to get up and running. Museum of History and Industry curator Kristen Halunin put on purple latex gloves to accept the donation of marijuana and other paraphernalia on Tuesday. Green brought eight grams of marijuana, which cost $160, including tax, 
two weeks ago when she was first in line. She donated a two gram sealed packet of cannabis, the t-shirt she wore as she waited for hours in line to make the buy, and the book she read while she waited in line. The well-prepared green had brought a chair, sleeping bag, food, water, and a 930-page book so she could camp out in line overnight. Green had offered the items to the museum, museum spokesman Jackie Durbin said. I wanted to be a part of history. This is part of the history of our city, Green told the Puget Sound Business Journal. The museum is collecting memorabilia from Washington's legalization initiative and plans to put them on display this autumn. It also plans a traveling exhibit in April 2015, right around 420, we're thinking, and marijuana will be included in that exhibit, Durbin said. Second Washington story, Moody's says high taxes may slow marijuana revenue in Washington state. High taxes and a low number of storefront licenses mean that revenue from legalized marijuana sales in Washington state could be minimal this year, according to Moody's Investor Service. State licensed recreational marijuana stores opened in Washington on July 8, and the state estimated it will collect $51.2 million in revenues during the upcoming 2015 to 2017 biennial budget. But Moody's said on Monday that high taxes, marketplace competition, and supply challenges could lower that number. The ratings agency warned that Washington's sky-high excise tax of 25% applied at three points along the supply chain, producer, processor, and retailer, and sales taxes on top of that of 9.6% might deter consumers, you think? Combine the trio of 25% taxes means an effective tax rate of 44%, Moody's calculated. The tax structure in Washington state is likely to be a major deterrent for consumers who do not see the value in obtaining a product from a storefront as opposed to a medical dispensary, Moody's analyst Andrea Unsworth wrote in the report entitled, Tax Revenues from Legalized Marijuana Will Be Minimal in Washington State. Colorado, in contrast, charges a 15% excise tax and a 12.9% consumer sales tax. The state's recreational marijuana market has a burdensome tax structure for consumers, Moody said, adding that many residents might prefer to buy marijuana from a medical dispensary which requires a doctor's authorization. Another limiting factor on the availability of recreational marijuana is the fact that Washington regulators have issued only 7% of the available licenses for cannabis retailers. That's just 24 out of 334 licenses. This is largely due, they say, to a huge backlog of applications and strict requirements for eligibility, Moody's reported. Now, most of the recreational marijuana revenues in Washington state are already earmarked to go to law enforcement, drug treatment programs, and marijuana education and health services. About 19% of collected tax revenues will go to the state's general fund. The shortfall in tax revenues won't be a problem for Washington's credit rating, according to Moody's, because tax revenues from recreational marijuana were always budgeted to be a minimal source of state funding. No tax revenues from canna cannabis were included in the 2013 to 2015 biennial budget. The state said it will be collecting $318,000 in excise taxes after the first 10 days of marijuana sales, and the Washington State Liquor Control Board figures that the state's take that would be the state's take of what's been estimated as $1.27 million in marijuana sales so far in Washington. The third Washington story, we have a marijuana businessman suing the Liquor Control Board over a denied marijuana sales license. This Washington marijuana businessman is saying the agency rejected his application to retail cannabis over a minor technicality. His lawsuit alleges that the board put him and his partners at risk of substantial financial loss. The suit was filed by Pete O'Neill in King County Superior Court, and it seeks to overturn the Liquor Control Board's decision to deny a license for CNC cannabis to sell marijuana in Linwood, Washington. The application was rejected for only having an electronic signature instead of both a written signature and an electronic one, according to O'Neill, who manages CNC. Officials at the Washington State Liquor Control Board refused to comment on ongoing litigation. The board could be subjected to dozens or even hundreds of similar lawsuits as it makes its way through the first year of implementation of I-502, a limited legalization measure approved by 54% of Washington voters in 2012. The first cannabis store is open on July 8 and more gradually opening for business as the supply from growers increases. 334 retail licenses were awarded statewide. 
More lawsuits by disappointed entrepreneurs like the one filed by O'Neill are expected. Many business people feel wronged by what they say is a system which set them up for failure. This is unfortunately typical of the Liquor Control Board's total mismanagement of the state's recreational marijuana system that has plagued potential licensees since the program began. Steve Surich of the Seattle-based Cannabis Action Coalition told Hemp News Monday afternoon. This is only one of many lawsuits you can expect to see against the Liquor Control Board, and the LCB has little chance of prevailing. According to Surich, the lawsuits could easily cost the state more to settle than the Liquor Control Board collects in tax revenues. I think it's a shame that so many of these startup businesses are going bankrupt before they even have the opportunity to get their doors open, Surich said. Many will be losing their entire investments and will be unable to afford the legal resources to recoup their losses that are being caused by this LCB mismanagement. The House Government Affairs and Oversight Committee, run by Representative Chris Hurst, seems to be unwilling or unable to hold the Liquor Control Board accountable for their rogue behavior, according to Surich. It's time this committee starts doing some investigation into this mismanagement before they find themselves with the same type of debacle they faced with the LCB's sale of the privatized liquor stores. Search is referring to the fact that Washington voters in 2011 took away the Liquor Control Board's monopoly on liquor sales in the state. They effectively fired the Liquor Control Board from being in charge of alcohol sales in the state due to its mismanagement and a stagnant and inflated system of price controls. CNC Cannabis, which was named with a nod to Cheech and Chong, attracted local investors buying in at $25,000 per unit. Now they have no license to sell cannabis and no obvious way to reimburse their increasingly angry investors. O'Neill has personally invested $20,000 in rent for the Linwood location. CNC is the only applicant trying for the second open retail license in Linwood. There are no competitors for the spot. But O'Neill said the board rejected his application anyway. It was filed three weeks before the deadline. CNC is damaged every day the Liquor Control Board refuses to process its Linwood application, reads the lawsuit filed July 16th. It cannot determine if it should invest more resources to advocate against or legally challenge Linwood's moratorium on permits for cannabis businesses, or it has clear standing to do so. And in our final Washington story, blacks have been disproportionately ticketed for public marijuana use in Seattle under the legalization law. Now, when this limited marijuana legalization measure, Initiative 502, was on the state ballot back in 2012, one of the main selling points touted by its supporters was that the measure would help eliminate racial disparities in low-level marijuana enforcement, the kind that exists practically everywhere, and which were the subject of a recent American Civil Liberties Union study. But sadly, it appears I-502 didn't make a lot of difference in that regard. African Americans were still disproportionately cited by Seattle police for using marijuana in public in the first six months of 2014, according to Bob Young at the Seattle Times. In a report required by the Seattle City Council, the police had to admit that of 82 tickets written for public cannabis consumption in the first half of 2014, 37% of those went to black people. Now, blacks account for just 8% of Seattle's population. 50% of the tickets for public consumption went to whites, who were 70% of Seattle's residents. Of course, racially discriminatory enforcement of marijuana laws was one of the main arguments for legalizing pot in the first place. A national study by the ACLU found that almost four blacks are arrested on marijuana charges for every one white person arrested. The Seattle Police Department study found that 99% of all tickets for public use of marijuana were issued for infractions in the West Precinct. Those were mainly in Victor Steinbrook Park, Westlake Park, Occidental Park, and on downtown streets. The public consumption tickets come with a $27 fine. Of the 82 tickets written, just five fines had actually been paid, according to the police. Women accounted for just 11% of the tickets. 41% of those who were cited lived in low-income housing, shelters, motels, or vacant lots. Those written up ranged in age from 18 to 77 years old, according to the Seattle Police Department. Police said they'll continue to collect data through 2015, as required by the City Council. A robust analysis of the social justice implications of the tickets will not be available until that time, said Assistant Chief Mike Washburn. While the sample size is small, it does indicate trends for race and homelessness that we should continue to monitor, reads a joint statement from City Attorney Pete Holmes and City Council Member Nick Lakata. They also said that the report shows the need for places where people can legally consume marijuana in Seattle. 
Even after passage of I-502 in Washington state, blacks there are still three times as likely as whites to be arrested for marijuana possession. And Allison Holcomb of the Washington ACLU, the chief author of I-502, seems to accept that as par for the course. It is unfortunate, but not terribly surprising, that we're still seeing disproportionate numbers in public infraction tickets, Holcomb said this week. Before we go this week, there is a must-read that you really should devote your attention to. Marijuana shows great promise for Alzheimer's, but research is stalled. You can find this on TopeSignals.com, and you will learn from the story that early use of marijuana apparently delays and might even prevent the onset of Alzheimer's disease, and that's according to a leading scientist in the field. But the work of longtime researcher Gary Wink of Ohio State University has come to a halt despite those promising results. Wink said, we found out that people who smoked dope in the 1960s were not getting Alzheimer's. They have a bunch of 90-year-olds without dementia. They were wondering what's going on. But maddeningly, his research has ground to a halt due to political, legal, and financial reasons. The evidence in animals is clear, but making that leap to humans means you have to find a drug company willing to handle the lawsuits and the money, Wink said. It's particularly hard to get marijuana from the federal government for medical studies because the National Institute on Drug Abuse has admitted it only looks for the bad effects of marijuana and isn't particularly interested in the good effects. But Wink makes an excellent point. He says if we can decline, if a typical American family could decline the entry into a nursing home of an elderly person for five years, that would save an incredible amount of money because these nursing homes are very expensive. So it would help people in a very direct way in their pocketbooks if this treatment were available to more people. I think that we all agree that more research needs to be done on this. With Alzheimer's ranking as the sixth leading cause of death in the United States and with more than five million Americans currently struggling with this disease, which has no known cure, you'd think that lab results as promising as winks would have attracted major funding by now. But that's not the case because, as we pointed out, the NIDA isn't really interested in knowing about the medical benefits of marijuana, just its dangers. I hope that you will take my advice and stay lifted this week and join us again next week for the next episode of Toke Signals. Have a good one.